Oh, in order to manage the vessels, large vessels, you need, as in all surgery, a perfect knowledge of the anatomy. Either in the mastoid, in the temporal bone, and in the neck. And then we, when you go intradurally, a perfect knowledge of the intradural vessels. Uh, just to remind you that we are dealing with internal carotid artery and external carotid artery, as you saw yesterday. Yesterday, in dissecting the neck, the external carotid was confused with the internal carotid. But when we do this, we cannot confuse. Otherwise, we might have some very bad surprise. And then there are, of course, vessels intracranially that we have to know, that we see later on. And then, of course, is a venous system which sometimes is more important than the arterial system. The venous system consists of a part which is extradural, extracranial in the neck, which is a jugular vein with the, uh, the branches, and intracranially, the jugular vein becomes sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, torcular. These are all the sinus we are dealing with when we are doing acoustics, when we are doing glomerular tumor or petrous apex lesions. And you see here the jugular bulb, and then we have here the inferior petrosal sinus, the superior petrosal sinus, and this is the condylar sinus. You see this is the foramen manium. And the sigmoid sinus is in your way, always. Either when you do closed technique or you open technique. For example, this is a closed technique with the sigmoid sinus, the posterior canal wall, middle fossa dura, and the sinus dura angle, and then you see how near to the facial nerve is the sigmoid sinus. So when you do this type of surgery, you must know where the facial nerve, but you have to deal with a far advanced sigmoid sinus. And also in open technique, you see, this is an open technique, the facial nerve is there. This sigmoid sign is advanced. When you find this, then you do an open technique or bondy technique. This is the bondy, you see? And this is an open technique here. The chain is not there anymore and not the tympanic membrane. This is the station tube, this is the muscle of the malleus. But this is the sigmoid sinus, always in your way. Then the sigmoid sinus becomes a jugular bulb. And we have seen yesterday in the dissection, this is the jugular bulb. And if you do acoustics, you have to deal with sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb. You have to know that this is the facial nerve, that sometimes the jugular bulb is very high. It touch the inner part of the fallopian canal. And then when you do middle ear, you know, you must know that the facial nerve is posteriorly to the bulb. This is the jugular bulb here. You see the, the jugular vein. So you have to know the relationship between the cochlea, the bulb, facial nerve, jugular bulb posteriorly, and sigmoid sinus. When you do translab, you have to remove all this bone between the sigmoid and the, lat and, uh, between the bulb and the sigmoid because in this area, we have the control of the lower cranial nerves. Then, you see here, you have to know the relationship between the jugular bulb and carotid. This is the carotid, this is the cochlea. You have seen yesterday in the dissection, and this is the tendon of the, this is the malleus uh, muscle, this is the cochlear reform process, this is the round window. And then here, you see these very large, very large cells, bony cells over the sigmoid, and under the sigmoid and over the bulb. And then this is the carotid. You see it goes anteriorly. This is the eustachian tube. And then this is the relationship between bulb, facial nerve, and carotid, and between carotid and cochlea. This is the basal turn middle tongue, apical tongue. But you see, there is a very tiny bone between the cochlea and carotid. Then 
you have to deal with with emissary variant, which can be small. Yeah, uh, the tumor that I did in the emissary vein was very small, or it will be very large. And then, if you want to deal with the sigmoid and then press the sigmoid posteriorly, you have to uncover totally the emissary vein. You have to remove all the bone, otherwise you can't push posteriorly. And then this is the emissary vein. You, you uncover the sigmoid, it's a, an injected bone. Someone asked me how to obtain beautiful pictures. The only way is to do a very nice dissection without water, not bone dust, and injected. And then you see here the sigmoid sign. This is, this is much larger. So you deal with, with the sigmoid sign, jugular board, and emissary vein when you do trans lab approach. Or you deal with the sigmoid signs when you do middle ear. Then trans lab approach, you've seen that the classic trans lab. Uh, this, is, this is the approach that uh, the Bill House proposed in the 60s, not uncovering the, the sigmoid or just leaving a, a bony, what, is, what was called bony island. But the bony island is dangerous. You can, you, you can open the sigmoid. So you have to uh, identify the sigmoid. You have to use a larger diamond drill to uncover totally the sigmoid. This is the jugular bulb here, facial nerve, digastric ridge, the block of the labyrinth. This is the middle fossa. And then you see here, you remove the bone between the internal auditory canal and the jugular bulb, which is here. This is the cochlear aqueduct. This is the lower part of the dissection because if you continue here, you have damage of the lower cranial nerves. Then you dissect everything here at the transapical extension. This is the jugular bulb. And then you can extend superiorly and inferiorly in order to do transapical extension. This is the transapical. I did a paper with the Manoj, uh, uh, which is here. And then you see you displace the internal auditory canal contents. You can remove this. But you have to deal with here the superior petrolar sinus. This is the superior petrolar sinus. And then when you open, you have to deal with the basilar artery. This is a perforating artery. This is the scar. This is the clivus, contralateral clivus. This is the contralateral fifth cranial nerve. If you close one of these arteries, the patient dies for infarction of the pons. When you do middle fossa, you have to deal with either with superior petrosal sinus and with the carotid. This is the carotid. Here is the superior petrosal sinus. This is the cochlea. This is superior semicircular canal. This is the posterior. This is the lateral canal. This is the common cruz. And this is the internal auditory canal. This is the incus here in the malleus. And then you see you continue you have to deal with carotid this anterior foramen lacium, cochlea, and also the inferior petrosal sinus. Sometimes we have a high jugular bulb here. This is a retrolabyrinthine, retrosigmoid approach. The jugular bulb is very high. You see it touch the posterior semicircular canal. This is the endolymphatic sac. The superior petrosal sinus, which is this one. And then here start the inferior petrosal sinus, the jugular bulb, and sigmoid. Then, when you do retrosigmoid, you have to deal with the emissary vein. This is anterior placed sigmoid sinus. This is a transverse sinus up to here. Then, in order to open the dura, you have to transect the emissary vein and then open the dura later on. And when the, the jugular bulb is very high, you, have, you might have problem in doing retrosigmoid because sometimes it covers the internal auditory canal. But anyway, this is the lower cranial nerve, the cochlear aqueduct. And then this is the jugular bulb, and this is the jugular bulb. You see, if you do this section here, you must be aware that the jugular bulb and, sigma and this could be eye. When you do the transotic, then you leave in place the facial nerve, and then you have to deal with carotid, vertical portion, sigmoid sinus, emissary vein, jugular bulb, inferior petrosal sinus, superior petrosal sinus, and basilar artery. This is a transotic. You see the facial, the facial nerve in place. This is the jugular bulb. 
Jugo la bulb, she moves sinus, he appears the carotid ear, and then again at the end of the procedure, carotid, jugo la bulb, which is the anterior place, sigmoid sinus, and then here is superior petrolar sinus. Then if you do a modified transcochlear approach, it means that you remove all the external auditory canal, you reroute the facial nerve posteriorly, and then you have to deal with sigmoid, superior petrolar sinus, inferior petrolar sinus, carotid, either vertical or and horizontal, basilar, ska, ica, pica. And then this is a transcochlear approach. You see the carotid, jugular bulb, internal auditory canal, facial nerve. We replace, reroute the facial nerve posteriorly. This is the internal auditory canal. This is the clivus. This is the carotid, the jugular bulb. And then you see jugular bulb, sigmoid, superior petrolar sinus, area of the inferior, and carotid. And you remove this, and you open the dura, and then you go intradurally. If you do modify transcochlear approach type B, you need to transect the trigeminal nerve, that's as we did yesterday, and to transect the middle meningeal artery, and then you will be able to control carotid artery, vertical, horizontal, genu, and pre and precavenous carotid, the basilar artery, and all those branches. And then this is, this is the basilar artery, trigeminal nerve, contralateral, trigeminal homolateral, six cranial nerve, facial nerve, carotid, genu, carotid precavenous, and then here this anterior foramen lacerum and carotid intracavernous carotid here, and then the six cranial nerve from the eye down to the carotid to the brain stem here. And then if you do a type C, we open the dura and the tentorium. And then here you have to deal with another very dangerous vein. This is a labus vein. If you damage this labus vein, the patient dies. Because a such patient is in the left, because there is an infarction of the temporal lobe. So when you open the, the tentorium, you must be very careful not to touch this vein and not to press the vein. And then you see beautiful view of the labus vein here. This is the tentorium, this is the trigeminal nerve, this is the ska, this is the ska, this is the ska. This is the posterior cerebral artery. This is the middle meningeal artery. This is the carotid. This is the basilar. And then type D, you extend the approach inferiorly and you have to deal with, you close the jugular vein in the neck. You close the sigmoid sinus, either extradural or intradural. And then you have to deal with basilar, pica, vertebra. This is the 12th cranial nerve, 9, 10, 11. This is a six cranial nerve, and this is a clivus. An infratemporal force approach. We have seen yesterday. This is a right ear, like yesterday. We, have, we, we go to the neck to identify jugular vein and carotid, common and internal and external carotid. Then the jugular bulb, the sigmoid sinus, the jugular bulb, the, the facial nerve. Then we displace and reroute the facial nerve anteriorly in order to free this area. You have seen yesterday, once the facial nerve has been freed and anteriorly rerouted, then we had immediately the control of the jugular bulb and not of carotid. Then we remove the stylomastoid, the stylomastoid process, the styloid process, and the tympanic bone. And then we had the control of this part of the carotid. And you see here, this is sigmoid sinus. We have closed it extra luminally. Then we have followed the jugular bulb here, posteriorly. I told you, we approach the tumor from posterior and from lateral. In order to approach the tumor from posteriorly, we have to control all the jugular bulb from the occipital bone here and from the mastoid. So this is necessary to remove here. Then you see, you have the control of all the sigmoid all the bulb and the jugular. Then we have pushed surgical intraluminally in the inferior this direction, and then we have our open the sigmoid signs here, and then you see this is the 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 surgical. This is the inner wall of the internal of the jugular of the sigmoid signs, 
And then once you have done this, we have closed the jugular bulb, and then we open the jugular bulb. You see, the, ju the, the, the jugular vein has been closed. You see here, we push the jugular vein. It seems the case of yesterday, exactly. And what we do in surgery, we describe. And what we describe, we do. Because you have, we have, must have very clear-cut ideas if you want to teach something. If you see some surgeon that is say, oh, this is very easy, I can't do that. Okay, this is a good surgeon. If you see someone and say, oh, this is so difficult, I can never do that, it's a very bad good surgeon. You are not you that you are not able to do that. He's, he's a very bad teacher. And you see, we have opened now and pushed uh, upwards the jugular board, the jugular vein. We have opened the jugular vein and then we have identified the inferior petrosal sinus. But you see here, we have the 10th, the 9th, and then the 11 is there. We have cut yesterday 10th, 11, but we have cut also the 12th. And you see here, this is the, the carotid, this is the cochlea, this is free, this area. And then the infratemporal type B, we did something yesterday. You leave the facial nerve in place, and then you can dissect the carotid vertical, genu, horizontal, up to the anterior foramen lacerum. You can remove the bone between the cochlea and the jugular bulb, between the carotid and the jugular bulb, and you can reach the clives here. This is the infratemporal type B. So here we're dealing with superior petrosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, jugular bulb, sigmoid sinus, and carotid. And uh, type C, which is indicated for rhinopharynx lesions, like uh, recurrent carcinoma or angio juvenile angiofibroma or other type of tumors. Then we have to deal with jugular vein here, the sigmoid sinus, the carotid. And you have to displace and to cut the middle meningeal artery, the trigeminal nerve, third portion, and then to push the muscle and the, mm, uh, the zygomatic arch inferiorly and to reach the rhinopharynx. This is the this is an intubation tube. And then POTS. This is indicated for tumors located non-vascular in the jugular bulb, like, like schwannomas of the lower cranial nerves or meningiomas of the jugular bulb. Then we need to control the jugular vein in the neck Sometimes the vertebral, we cut the sigmoid sinus and we can control here the trigem, the basal artery. This is the right ear, this is the labyrinth, this is the facial nerve, this is the jugular bulb, sigmoid sinus. We remove the bone between the inferior petrol, uh, the posterior semicircular canal, medially to the facial nerve. We remove all this bone and do infralabyrinthine dissection. Then we reach the carotid here. Once we have reached the carotid, you can displace and to drill the occipital condyle here. And then go into the neck. We control the jugular vein. You see, this is the lateral process of the atlas. It's a very bad, the best landmark to find the jugular vein. Just you touch, and then just anteriorly and medially to the lateral process of the atlas, we have the jugular vein. Then we have 10, 11, and then is the, the 12th, then you will see two nerve, this is the vertebral artery. And then is the sigmoid sinus, jugular bulb, this occipital condyle, this emissary of the occipital condyle here. These are emissary, posterior emissary veins. When you open in the, in the jugular foramen tumor, the jugular bulb, and then you close the inferior petrosal sinus, you can have still bleeding, and it comes from this vein the, from this um, sinus. Then we open the dura and we find here 9, 10, 11, occipital condyne, carotid, jugular bulb has been closed. Then we have the ica and then we have the vertebral artery. You see, here is the pica, here is the scar. Uh, management is based on otoscopy examination, radiological walk-up, differential diagnosis, and surgical, then comes surgical intervention. Otoscopy and radiology. You can have high jugular bulb. If you see some blue area, this is the jugular bulb. Here, see, uncovered. 
then if you do a transcanal approach, you must be aware, don't touch with the, with the knife this part, otherwise you have a terrible bleeding. And then here is the perforation case, you see the, the bulb, which is covered by bone, and this is the bulb. Then high jugular bulb again here, and you see is practically attached to the tympanic membrane. And then again, a high jugular bulb, you see, it goes to the middle ear. And again, high jugular bulb is very important if you do, for example, acoustic tumor through retrosigmoid, this is impossible because the jugular bulb covers completely the internal auditory canal. And here there are two jugular bulbs covering the canal, one and two. You see the canal is there. So you cannot go through the posterior uh, approach. And there's one next resonance imaging, this high jugular bulb, norm, normal jugular bulb, and very high jugular bulb. You reach, you see the labyrinth. And again, another one, this is a diverticulum of the jugular bulb. You see, it goes over the middle ear, over the promontorium, and then this is the venous face. You see here, this is the promontorium. And this magnetic resonance imaging, magnetic resonance angiography. You see here, and then here, and then here. Then you have an ectopic carotid. You see, this is different from high jugular bulb. This is anterior and red. The, high, the jugular bulb is posteriorly and blue. And then when you see something red, look, this, this carotid, this carotid. I have a case, no, I know a case, that one of my colleagues, he was based on the uh, neuroradiology, neuroradiology's answer, and they say it's a glomus tympanicum tumor. Look at this. It seems a glomus tympanicum tumor. Then it goes through to the posterior tympanotomy, puff, it removes the glomus and carotid, 24 years old, dead. And this is another case, another biopsy of the ectopic carotid. And then he was uh, fortunate enough to live be, uh, near us. He came and we closed the carotid with Guglielmi's spiral. And he was saved. And then after this, we closed the external auditory canal, cooled the sac in order to avoid infection. And this is another aneurysm, of, this is a non-ectopic aneurysm of the carotid. You see, this is the carotid in the contralateral side, this is the carotid here, and then all this. This is an aneurysm. And this is the lateral displacement of the carotid. You see, you remember that yesterday I told you that you have some, uh, when you have X-rays, you have a CAT scan, in order to identify the vessels, which are, you have to do a trick, C, which is the yeah. And C is the carotid, always C and C. And then we have the vestibule, is V and vein, vestibule and jugular bulb. And this is glomus jugulari tumor here, glomus tympanicum tumor here, diagnosis, you see? Is the glomus, there is no erosion, so this is type B. And this is type C. You see, black. And then you have erosion here, and you see the carotid is type C3. And again, erosion of the internal auditory canal and magnetic resonance imaging, we have to deal with sigmoid sinus and carotid, which is this one. And then angio MRI, and here, and angiography. You have to deal with the sigmoid sinus, the torcular vein, the jugular bulb. You have to know if the contralateral is performed, is open, this is the arteriography. And then you have to make diagnosis when it's blue, all the tympanic membrane. It's not jugular bulb, it's not carotid, but it's cholesterol granuloma. It's a cholesterol granuloma. And when it's not blue, it's not red, but it's whitish, it's tumor. It could be meningioma, 
of the temporal bone or facial nerve neuroma. You see, and then you do this, the facial nerve neuroma here. See, the facial nerve is here, it goes there. And why it could be meningioma. So the retrotympanic mass are very important. The color is very important. So you, you, have, you have to doubt a diagnosis through the otoscopy. And then you see it's white, and then it was a meningioma. Now, surgical management of large vessels. It depends on surgical approaches and on the lesions. In middle ear, when the sigmoid sinus is anterior, contracted mastoid cavity, then it's better if you do an open technique and you have to deal with the sigmoid sinus. And when there is bleeding from the sigmoid sinus, don't try to coagulate with bipolar, it doesn't stop. Just use a large time bar without water and it stops immediately, like, like you saw yes, today. But this is if is a, a bleeding from the bone. But if it is a bleeding from the vessel, from the, from the outer, is, the bone has been already removed, then you put surgeon not inside, like I did yesterday in the, in the labyrinthectomy. Don't put surgeon inside, because if you put surgeon inside by aspiration, it causes then, and then you have pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. And then you have to deal with the glomus type B. You see here we did the posterior tympanotomy anteriorly and then posteriorly in order to remove here. And then you have to be aware that the glomus is real B and not C. Otherwise, you have an open jugular foramen, jugular bulb are with a very difficult control of the bleeding. Now, when you do uh, the surgery for uh, acoustic, for example, you might have this situation. The sigmoid sign is very, very anterior place. The, the, the approach is very narrow. This the this um, transverse uh, sinus, and then you have the jugular bulb, which is very high. He, you see, is the internal auditory canal is under the sigmoid sign, under the jugular bulb. It seems impossible to go to pass. Then. What you do, and then you, su you use surgical control to the open sigmoid. You put surgical just over, and then you, you put a cottonoid and you stay there. You wait a few minutes and then it will stop. Then the sigmoid sounds can be closed like this, but I do not do this anymore. Because you open the dura and you can have CSF. I do intraluminal uh, closure. And then you see here you have the sigmoid sinus, the inferior, superior petrolar sinus, jugular bulb, inferior carotid. You can, uh, co if you open this, you can control with surgical inside here, but never inside the sigmoid. And then is the infratemporal fossa. You see the jugular bulb, the jugular, uh, sigmoid sinus, patient nerve displaced. This is a right ear like yesterday. I displace the facial nerve and then I ask it for glue. You see the facial nerve is glued there. It seems the case of yesterday. And then we have closed the sigmoid sound extra luminally, not with suture, in order to, to avoid bleeding and to avoid CSF leak. Then we push surgical cell inferiorly. Here is the carotid. And then sometimes, it, it, this is very bad, but you have to clip the sigmoid. You see, we use two big clips in order to stop and to open the sigmoid. And here, you see the identification of the internal auditory canal is very difficult. Here you have jugular bulb. And then what you do, we drill, we uncover the jugular bulb, and then we push the jugular bulb inferiorly with surgical and bone works. And then at the end, this is surgical and then there's a the bone walks. Once you have used, you see bone walk, you have done this, then you can continue to drill and have more space for the removal of the tumor. You see here is another one, very high. Then we did uh, this, uh, this section, and then this another one, and then you push medially without closing. This is a periosteum, 
and then we control with bone walks, and then you have place to drill this part. Then the emissary vein is a very large emissary vein. You see the sigmoid sinus, the very large. You cannot push posteriorly the sigmoid sinus if you don't close this emissary vein. In order to close this, you have to uncover totally from bone, then coagulate here, and then at that time, you can push the sigmoid sinus posteriorly. And then there's another case, you see the dura, the transverse sinus, you have uh, coagulated this by polar coagulation, and then you can deal with. And then jugular, bo jugular vein closed with two or three sutures. And then once the jugular vein is closed, then you push, up, uh, how here is the jugular bulb, jugular vein, then here is closed, you push up, and then you open the jugular bulb and you have the opening of the inferior petrosal sinus. When you do middle force approach, you can have, you can have the, sigmoid, the superior petrosal sinus here, and when you do translab approach, we have the superior petrosal sinus here. Sometimes with the drill you open, then you must close the, with surgery cell. Uh, this is a case presentation of a temporal fossa. You see, this is the tumor. This is the tumor. This is the carotid arteriography. This is after embolization. This is the venous. Then, we, this is sigmoid sinus. We do an extra luminal packing, as, as you have seen yesterday. And then, uh, intraluminally in the inferior direction. Then, you close the jugular vein, you push up the jugular vein, this is the, this is the, the area of the nine, the, excuse me, 11 cranial nerves here. Then we close the jugular bulb here, and then we have to deal with the carotid. Here is the carotid. And you see here this net, this is the stent. And then you see here all the carotid vein and the carotid. And then there's a POTS, this lower cranial nerve schwannoma. Here you don't need to remove the external auditory canal. You can leave, the, you can um, preserve the hearing. You do not need to reroute the fascia nerve anteriorly. But you do, you close this jugular bulb with a slight opening in the neck uh, using the lateral process of the other as a landmark. Then you close the jugular vein. And then you uh, dissect the sigmoid sinus. Then here the sigmoid sinus dissected. This is the facial nerve. Then we drill this area. This is the jugular bulb, facial nerve intact. This is the middle ear. This is the incus. Then you close the jugular vein, the jugular, excuse me, the sigmoid sinus, and then you open like a book. And then you go and you remove the tumor, intradural tumor. Acoustical facial bundle, nine cranial nerve, and then this is the post op. You see the mastoidectomy, and the post operative hearing is, is preserved. And then the management of the carotid. The carotid can be skeletonized, as we did yesterday, superiority, subaventicia dissection, can be displaced, occluded, occluded with balloon, or reinforced with stents. Then when you skeletonize, you can do is post inferiorly and posteriorly with a drill, and then you can go under to pass to the other side, is superiorly. Then you can peel out the tumor here, is anterior. You see you're using bipolar and an instrument here, and then here is the carotid. Here you, you see the carotid with tumor. Then you peel out the carotid from the tumor. This is the carotid in, now intact and free from tumors. Or if you have a kinking carotid, see so you continue to dissect and to remove the tumor from the carotid. Here is the carotid. And you can displace the carotid. For example, in, in uh, condor sarcomas here, located, located in the petrous apex. This is a case, you see the chondrosarcoma here pushing over the brainstem. This is the carotid, this is the, oh, this is all the tumor. 
And then we did uh, a subtotal petrosectomy. We left intact the cochlea and the labyrinth. And then we dissect all the, all the carotid. Then we place the carotid anteriorly in order to remove the tumor. You see, total removal of the tumor has been accomplished. If you remove totally, they, the chondrosarcoma, they do not need radiotherapy. They do not recur. And this is another case of, of cholesterol granuloma. It's total deafness. You see the internal toric canal. We did the trans uh, it is uh, You see uh, infratemporal fossa type B and trans type B. This is the cochlea. This is the facial nerve in place. You see we modify the approach removing a lot of bone over the middle fossa. This the carotid, vertical, horizontal, uh, genu, horizontal anterior foramen lacerum. We displace the carotid anteriorly and this is a total removal. We reached the sphenoid signs, and we obliterated all the sphenoid signs. You see, we have left the, the, antenna, the inner ear intact. This is a total removal, you see? We, then the balloon, occlusion. We can occlude the, car the carotid, one, two, three balloons, and these are the cases. This is an acoustic, no, this is a trigeminal schwannoma of the second branch. This is the, or, the rectal orbital. This patient had only one eye, and this was that one. And then this carotid inside, we closed the carotid with balloon, and then this is the removal. You see the balloon here. We remove this together with the tumor. When we now use, uh, in many cases, reinforcement with stent instead of closing the carotid with balloon uh, for insufficient collateral blood supply. Uh, in the past years, the fish consider this case inoperable. It has published it always. If there is a sufficient collateral blood supply, the patient is inoperable. But we have a principle. Nothing is inoperable unless, unless uh, you find a way. And we now, we operate these cases. Also, irradiated tumors, revision surgery, and in single carotid. They, 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 there are cases now that are, they are coming. They are already operated in other departments for a carotid on the contract, for a chromosome contract on the side. For example, a carotid, uh, um, carotid body tumors with the closure of the carotid. So they come with a glomerular tumor in the other side with only single carotid. They were inoperable until today. Today are operable. And we had done some of them. And encasement of carotid 360 degree, and anyway, in any case of C3 and C4. What is the advantage of a carotid of a stent? It avoids theoretical complications of the balloon occlusion in the long run. For example, aneurysm. And it permits to operate the so called unoperable cases. Eh? And there is a drawback, that the patient is forced to take cardiospirin for life, like in patients that had stents in the coronary arteries. Uh, we use generally Hubbard expert. There is a diameter of five, six millimeters. The length different, it is self-expanding, and it is nickel, nickel plus titanium. This is the stent. And this is a case, you see, left carotid, tumor blush. This is, a, this is a here, this is stenosis after thereography and after embolization. This stenosis is indication of infiltration of the wall of the carotid. When the wall is infiltrated, you need to peel out. And in order to avoid blowout, you use better use stent. This is another, you see, stent positioning. They still, again, vasospasm pass do the stenting, and then after stenting, here. And then this is the case. You see you are peeling out the tumor from the carotid here. Then we displace it 360 degree. We can displace the carotid anteriorly. This, you see the stent. We peel out until the, the media, well, the adventitia 
is completely removed, so it's removed the tumor. If you do that without stent, you'll blow out. And then this is the final result here. The stent must be longer than the position of the tumor, at least one centimeter down and one centimeter up. And then the indication is when 360 degrees is, in, is infiltrated. This is another case of stent. And this is another case. You see here, it's very difficult. It's the, the interest of the base of the scalp. You see, you can displace the carotid. You can drill out without any fear. And then this is another case here. And this is a clinical case. That's, this is the indication. Carotid involved here. This is the stenosis, stent. This is the approach. And this carotid, you see, we drill anteriorly to the carotid. And then is, you see the carotid totally infiltrated. And then there's a post up here. And here the stent. And when is contraindicated, when there is a kinking, very, very high kinking, you see? And this is the, the cadaveric dissection. It's not the same patient, of course. But you see the kinking of the carotid here, very, very much kinking the facial nerve. This is the uh, lateral, this is the jugular bulb, jugular vein, jugular bulb, sigmoid sinus. You see, this is very important to drill out here, but you have to be careful. Here we have the basilar artery, the, excuse me, the vertebral artery. Look here. So you can drill here, but you have, must be aware that the vertebral artery is there. This is the lateral process of the artery, the C1. We have C2. If you remove C1, you can have the, the, the vertebra, you can displace posteriorly the vertebra. So you can do here an ex extremely lateral approach. But nowadays, even if we have kinking, we have changed the stent. We have a very flexible stent that can be used also in kinking. Between 83 and 2004, we have done 2,100 skull based searches. And uh, 300 cases treated by the group pathologic, which requires some management of a carotid. These are the pathologists. These are the approaches. These are skeletonized here. Uh, dissection, superventitial, superiostal, special in global jugular tumors. And uh, displacement of the, the carotid in chordomas, the chondrosarcomas, and lower cranial nerve schwannomas. Balloon, resection, the occlusion and dissection, and stenting. Now we have done more than 20 stenting, especially in glomus jugulari, tumors in glomus vagaris, and two cases of carcinoma could be another indication. Uh, you, you, when the carotid is involved, uh, you can peel out and then do radiotherapy. Uh, some of these cases, they are still alive after three or four years. But the problem is the oncological problem. So this can be indicated only if you want to give some months or some year more to the patient. And the complication, so far we had only two complications, uh, which are related to the carotid manipulation preoperatively. In our one, no, one pre and one intraoperatively. There was an intimal dissection during balloon occlusion. And the patient had hemiplegia that recovered totally and with the physical rehabilitation. And we had the intraoperative injury, which is a pre-stent error. And we repaired and maintained the patency. So in conclusion, large vessels in the middle ear, in the inner ear and skull base, are, they are always encountered. So you have to know how to manage. And they often require the management of these vessels. Especially difficult is jugular bulb, sigmoid sinus, jugular, mm, jugular vein, and especially carotid. The carotid can be simply skeletonized, dissected, or displacement or bypass balloon intimal. In conclusion, if you want to do autology, neurotology, and lateral skull base, then you must know the anatomy perfectly. In order to know the anatomy, you must 
do this section and you must visit the center where this surgery is done routinely. Thank you very much indeed.